the Kings pretty handedly beat the Clippers 109-95. And this game was really nice to see because against the Jazz, you know, we were kind of coming off news of we're losing Kevin Herter for the season and we're losing Malik Monk probably for the season unless we, you know, get to the second round maybe. But I think in in games coming off an injury or a trade, things like that, a lot of times teams will get a response and you'll have a big performance. And especially when it's against a team like the Jazz, you can say, well, it's it's just the Jazz, right? And so it was nice to see coming into another game against a much better team, sure without Kawhi Leonard, but still a good team in the Los Angeles Clippers with very good players. We saw the same thing that we saw against the Utah Jazz. So we kind of know now it's not just a one game thing. And obviously having Trey Lyles back, Sasha Vizenkov back, that's huge for our bench. And our bench was amazing in this game. And it needs to you know, continue to be, I'm sure it won't be this good where we get 14 points from Davion Mitchell, 15 points from Trey Lyles and Len Sanity off the bench in his 12 minutes, just seven rebounds, three blocks, a steal, just doing everything. But still, it's going to require that effort from the entire team that we saw in both of these games against the Jazz and the Clippers to be able to close this season strong after the injuries that uh, that we've sustained. And this game really was all about the bench because from the start, this game was kind of crazy from the start. Sabonis and Paul George kind of exchanging turnovers and misses and weird plays in both teams just like not in sync offensively at all like both teams not scoring in transition or executing in transition you had Sabonis missing a free throw you had Zubats missing two free throws it was just like this is one of the ugliest games of all time but I think one thing that we can see from that sure the Clippers looked poor offensively as well, but our defense was good to start the game, and so it made up for a slow start offensively, and I love the way that Keegan was aggressive, being aggressive. He had our first two field goals of the game. Again, he takes 18 shots, which I think is the exact amount that he took uh, against the Jazz, and my, my kind of four guys that needed to step up or change their roles because of the Malik Monk injury were Keegan Murray being more aggressive, He's done that in the Jazz game. He's done that in the Clippers game. I said Sabonis needs to take more shots. He took 17 shots and 10 free throws. I said De'Aaron Fox needs to be more, play more of a playmaker role, a true point guard role. He did that and was very good playmaking. Did not have a good shooting night, but his playmaking was still there. And then Davion Mitchell needs to step up off the bench in an offensive capacity, and he absolutely did that. Four for seven from three. He was making plays all over the place. A plus 16. He had a bunch of great drive and kicks. Three assists. And then also he pulled the chair on Clippers players like three times successfully. And they weren't all like the classic. Someone's posting you up and you just pull the chair. But just guys driving into him. And he just backs up. They're expecting that contact. And it totally messed up Paul George in transition. He did it to Westbrook, and he did it to someone else as well. He just had an amazing game on both ends of the floor. You could also see like the defensive instincts. Like He took a charge against Westbrook, but then on another play, I think someone got caught on a screen. Maybe Keegan. Keegan got caught on a few screens. His screen navigation was not great in this game, but right away, Davion's man has the ball way up at the top. He passes it to... down near the nail where Keegan isn't really, you know, he hasn't gotten to his man yet. And Davion immediately goes and helps. And it was just the awareness from him, him always being in the right spot. And man, after just such an ugly start to the season for Davion, he looked like he was going to be out of the league next year with how bad he was playing for an extended period of time. Here he is shooting like 50% from the corners from three and just being a sniper off the bench and making things happen off the dribble, being a playmaker. And we've seen it like three separate times now where he's had to step into a a more 
important role offensively because of injuries. Like throughout his career, we've seen it like three separate times. And I feel like he's performed every single time when he's been given the ball more or when he's been given more opportunity offensively. But it's just when he doesn't have that opportunity and he has to play more off ball, he hasn't looked great. But even before Malik Monk went down, he was playing better and shooting better when he was playing off the ball. And so if he can sustain this type of offensive production, obviously you're not going to get four for seven from three every night from him, but just the type of aggressiveness and playmaking from him, like we absolutely need that. And the Kings bench came in in that first quarter and just kind of calmed things down. I mean, things weren't going totally downhill, but we fouled two three-point shooters. And that was the difference in the game because it was a six-point game, like 17 to 11. But then also you had Keegan just leaving Paul George wide open twice, getting stuck on screens. And Mike Brown called a timeout right after the second one. You also had Mike Brown challenging on when Lyles fouled Paul George from three unsuccessfully. So a couple bad challenges from Mike Brown in a row, but it was okay. But it was Lyles coming in, hitting two threes, Keegan remaining aggressive uh, offensively, Fox with great playmaking, great passing, despite him not shooting well. Some of his three-pointers were not great. Like, I don't didn't love the shot selection, which I say after almost every game. But he was getting to the free throw line and hitting his free throws, which was nice. And I just think sometimes he has opportunities to drive into the lane where... Yes, he has space from three, but that space could also be turned into space for him to get ahead of steam going towards the rim. And so I'd like to see him do that a bit more. I thought one example of that was I think in the third quarter you had Fox who in transition didn't drive to the rim. There was only one defender for both him and Harrison Barnes and on the same side of the court. And so Fox, instead of driving to the rim, he makes a quick pass to Barnes, who, you know, got a decent look from three. Like, it wasn't a bad play. But he has to kind of rush it. The defender is still kind of there. If Fox just takes that to the rim, one, two more dribbles, the defender has to make a decision. And then Fox can either go to the rim all the way, or you're kicking out to Barnes for a better shot, him catching it in a better position, facing the rim, and with more space from the defender, who has his momentum going away from Barnes then. And I think you saw this because right after that, Barnes hit a three on a dribble handoff with Sabonis up top, but more of the one I was focused on was the next three that he hit, where Sabonis drives all the way to the rim, then kicks it out to the corner to Barnes, who you know is set facing the rim and is able to hit that three. And I just think that's a better look and why I want Fox getting into the paint more before he makes those passes. And that's something I've been critical of him the entire season and why I just don't think the Kings are a great transition offense team is because he doesn't put his head down and go to the rim when he should because he's so fast and he should utilize that speed to get into the paint and then create for others. But I feel like he's always just like looking to make the pass too early in those situations. But going back to the first half with the bench coming in, Alex Len just making a huge impact, getting three blocks in his first four minutes. And then also get a play where he comes out, I think hedges on a, a screen, and they trap. And Len with high hands, plus Fox there with high hands, forces the turnover, and Fox is able to get an open dunk in, on the fast break. And then you just had Len rebounding the ball against a smaller Clippers team. Evita Zubats had an awful game. It was funny because before the game, I was like looking on Twitter, saw some Clippers fans talking about how they think with more opportunity, Zubats could be a 15 to 20 point per game score. Kawhi Leonard's out. We need him offensively. And then he comes in. He's five for 14 with 10 points and just was awful around the rim. And with him having a bad game, he only played 29 minutes. And so you have Daniel Tice as the backup center playing 18 minutes, plus just some time of the Clippers not having a center out there, and the Kings just demolished the Clippers inside. Alex Len getting offensive rebounds, uh, he had two of them. Sabonis 
absolutely put this game away in the fourth quarter because of all his offensive rebounds. Like, the Kings had a pretty good lead, but the Clippers were kind of coming back because the Kings totally dropped off defensively. Like, the intensity wasn't there. But the Kings just kept scoring on the other end because Sabonis would just get offensive rebound after offensive rebound. He had 20 rebounds. So he had 20 rebounds. Alex Len had 7 rebounds. And the Kings had 20 offensive rebounds total. And the Clippers had only had 29 defensive rebounds. And so that's pretty similar to the last game against the Jazz where I think it was the Jazz had like 22 defensive rebounds and the Kings had 11 offensive rebounds or something like that. So the Kings' offensive rebound percentage is very, very high. I also like the way that Fox came out not settling for three in the second quarter. He got a mid-ranger to go, got to the line, but then he took a three. I'm just like, okay, we, we didn't need that shot. I just, he's so much better when he's just operating from inside the three-point arc. But then the Kings went on a big run to build that um, lead in the second quarter. And the Kings played well with both Fox and Sabonis on the bench. And Alex Len and Davion Mitchell were huge parts of that. And I thought, obviously, Alex Len's verticality around the rim affected a lot of shots. But I think you also had other guys who were doing the same. I thought Sasha's rotations were on point, And he was just always in the right spot contesting the shot. And so despite Sasha not having the biggest statistical game, I thought he was pretty good. He got a really nice steal. He had a drive that surprised me and probably surprised the defense, which is probably why it worked. From the corner, he just drove straight to the rim, drew the contact, got to the line, and the Kings did a pretty good job of drawing contact inside and getting to the line in this game. And obviously that'll happen when you're just getting a bunch of offensive rebounds as well. So Sabonis was in there getting to the line 10 times, like I said, only hit six of them, so not great. But still, he's getting to the line all those times. And the Kings were just able to create offense off of their defense. And I thought they created so many good three-point looks. And they only went 12 for 42. But I really have no problem with most of the three-point looks outside of Fox that they were taking. And the thing about all those looks is a lot of them, they got the offensive rebounds off of those misses. They just got so many good looks in this game if they were shooting well they could have blown the clippers out a lot more you had the clippers shooting 40 percent from three the kings shooting 28 percent from three and still the kings handled business comfortably the kings were just outworking the clippers and the clippers had a nice spell at the end of the second quarter because the kings did miss chances and so the clippers found their way back in norman powell got open a couple of times Harrison Barnes' defense was not good. Like, there, Norman Powell got open. Terrence Mann didn't even screen Barnes, and somehow Barnes still got stuck on Terrence Mann. And then you had Barnes getting switched on to, I think it was Harden. And that creates a pass to the corner for Powell from three. Yeah, Barnes did not have a good game in this one. He was awful defensively. The Clippers were searching him out. He wasn't giving enough offensively had two threes in the row in a row like I talked about in the third quarter but outside of that didn't do anything offensively so not a good game for him and the Kings missed like six straight just wide open threes not all of them wide open but most of them wide open and then Keegan had the other looks that weren't really wide open that you still expect him to you know, knock down because of the shooter that he is and he was being aggressive offensively and I loved that Davion broke that drought of missing six threes in a row, and so he was always coming in clutch. But uh, Kings were only up five at halftime just because of their poor shooting, but the defense was amazing. And so it's great to be able to rely on that defense, and that's what they've been doing the entire month of March is relying on their defense to keep them in games like this. And, you know, Harrison Barnes not having a good game, but those two threes that he hit in the third quarter were pretty big because... The Kings didn't get off to a great start um, offensively in the third quarter. Fox continuing to put up threes and miss. Uh, but then you had Domas working on the boards and then also pushing in transition. And those two threes created that space and the Kings really never looked back after that. And then the Kings offense just started flowing because you had 
Davion coming up with an offensive rebound that was forced by Sabonis hitting Keegan in the corner for three. You had Keegan postering Zubats in transition. That was fun. I think that came off the play where Davion kind of pulled the chair on Paul George and that forced him into a, like a weird moment in transition. And then Norman Powell like traveled as well or something. That was just, there were a lot of those moments where things were just kind of out of sor sorts for both teams, but the Kings were able to kind of thrive in that. And then you had three straight offensive possessions where Domas got a mismatch inside. And so the Clippers are doubling him pretty much with, he doesn't even have the ball and he's being doubled. And Keon flashes to the middle, catches the ball, immediately throws it over the top. And Domas gets an easy look inside. Then Davion gets inside, finds Domas. And I think that was when Domas got free throws. And then Keegan even driving and making a really nice pass. Like he delayed, delayed, then made the pass at the perfect time to Domas for six straight points. And you could see Savonis so proud of that pass from Keegan. And just the the playmaking ability on display. And we've seen that more from him over these past few games of his playmaking ability. And that's definitely where his game will need to grow. Mike Brown talked about it after one of the last games where he said he wasn't really asking Keegan to be a playmaker uh, right now. You know, that's something that Fox and Domas need to do where they're the stars they need to make their teammates better. And with Keegan, just like, shoot, if he's open. And so it's not something the Kings are asking him to do, but it's always a bonus when he can make the right pass. The Kings outscored the Clippers 35 to 19 in that third quarter. Just everything went well, pretty much. There's a fun three possessions in a row where Keon got a rebound, should have had an and one, but for some reason they called it on the floor. Then Paul George comes down, gets an and one, and then Keegan goes right back the other way, gets an and one. So it should have been three and ones in a row. But then to end the half, Fox taking matters into his own hands to really close the quarter strong, unlike kind of what happened in the second quarter. And he gets to the rim just by the entire Clippers defense. Beautiful drive for a layup. And then, and that was off of an Alex Len offensive rebound, of course. I feel like every good play the Kings made offensively was off an offensive rebound pretty much. And then the Clippers missed a three, and Fox comes down and gets a nice dish to Len for the dunk to end the quarter. And then Paul George holding the ball and not taking the shot with two seconds left in the quarter. I never liked that. But yeah, in that third quarter, the end of the third quarter, the Clippers just went no center, and the Kings just dominated. That was an awful decision from Teron Liu, and it... Pretty much put the game out of reach for the Clippers going into the fourth quarter. Also something I didn't really talk about, but uh, Chris Duarte got some minutes in this game. He got eight minutes. I think two of those minutes were garbage time minutes, so like six minutes. And I talked about Kessler Edwards coming in playing well. And so we'll see, you know, Chris Duarte will get his chance. And he got his chance in this game. Keon Ellis kind of got into foul trouble, which is another thing I've talked about recently. He's been having trouble with fouling too much and so he never he actually fouled out because he intentionally fouled to get out of the game uh near the end but uh, so pretty much five fouls for him that's definitely a problem he needs to learn and so he never really got into a rhythm got to the free throw line a few times to get three points seven rebounds still making a positive impact out there but not really in a rhythm and so chris duarte got the opportunity didn't really do anything special and so we'll see if they go back to Kessler Edwards. Because, I mean, I think Duarte is the better offensive player. Kessler is probably the better defensive player of the two. But lately, Kessler has been the one that's been knocking down the shots and not Duarte. So that's just interesting to see where the minutes go there. The start of the fourth quarter, though, the ball was zipping around. It felt like the Kings were just running circles around the Clippers. Just beautiful drives, beautiful ball movement. But they weren't really knocking down their shots. And when they didn't, then they got the rebounds. And then they still weren't really knocking down shots. And so it looked like beautiful offense, but they just really couldn't capitalize off of it. But they really were just the quicker team, just first to every ball. 
and they were getting steals and getting stops on the other end. So they were still outscoring the Clippers at that point. But yeah, the offense, they just couldn't hit shots, but it still looked good. And then the Clippers went on a little 5-0 run to cut it to 21. And Mike Brown's like, yeah, we need a timeout. And then Lyles came out and finished them off with a couple nice layups and then a take to the basket for an and one. So he had a nice seven point fourth quarter to close him out. And that pretty much did it. Although the Clippers with their bench unit in there kind of started coming back uh, late, but it wasn't enough because the Kings just getting offensive rebound after offensive rebound. Sabonis didn't have the best finishing game. Like he, he didn't shoot well, eight for 17, 0 for three from three, but he was just persistent and kept going at it inside. And also he hit a nice uh, free throw line jumper uh, off of a you know pick and roll and just look confident stepping into that. Taking three threes shows the confidence he has in the jump shot. So I'm not mad at that. And I kind of said, like, he needs to be more inefficient. Like, he's going to be more inefficient, but he needs to take more shots. And that's what he did. And he just needs to keep doing that. You know, Fox is out here being inefficient, 6 for 20. But it still was a, a good game for him. And also, Fox had zero turnovers with his good playmaking. So, a very good game for Fox, despite the uh, the lack of shooting there. But after the game, they interviewed Alex Len. And I just love something he said. He talked about what Jeff Hornacek uh, told him when he was a young player, I assume in Phoenix, right? Jeff Hornacek was the coach there. And he talked about, you know, coming off the bench, don't focus on points, rebounds, or any of that. Focus on the plus minus. And I just thought that was great because you look at him, he's a team high plus 18 in this game. And Davion coming off the bench, a, a plus 16, Lyles plus 14, Sasha, despite only scoring two points and like one rebound, one steal were his only stats. He's still a plus 12, making a positive impact out there. And so Len only scoring, what was it, four points, but leading the team in plus minus. And he, I think he leads the team in net rating this season. He's just a super positive impact in his 10 to 15 minutes that he gets out there every night. And he doesn't need any more than 10 to 15 minutes, but he's perfect for those 10 to 15 minutes of providing that rim protection, that rebounding with Sabonis out and just a stabilizing force. And it's just funny because it feels like the Kings, every chance they get, they're like, let's try someone else at backup center, you know, let's try someone else. Any excuse they get, they're like, oh, JaVale McGee, you know, oh, Chimeze Metu, like, we need someone else. It's like, nah, he's been here all along. Like he's in, even in his first stint in Sacramento, I thought he was really good. And he performs every time, every time he's out there. I feel like at times, maybe the coaching staff or front office have been like, we want someone that's, you know, a little, you know, can shoot or maybe is a better offensive player, provides that vertical threat like JaVale McGee does. But I think Alex Lund is perfect and he makes good decisions with the ball offensively as well. Talking a little bit more about the defensive side of the ball, I thought Keegan did a really good job on Paul George. I thought the Kings as a whole did a pretty good job guarding uh, James Harden, whether that was Keon or Fox getting out there. Again, anyone other than Barnes, really. Like when Sabonis got switched out on guards, I thought he did pretty well and the Kings did pretty well of recognizing it and getting in the right position to help. And the Kings rotations were just really, really good. There were only a few moments where the Clippers got open from three. You know, Norm Powell had two, Paul George had two. And other than that, it was just, you know, maybe a few role players getting open from the corners, but the contests were coming, you know, BJ Boston maybe, you know, going three for six, but from the field, but, uh, you know, you have Westbrook going two for three from three. Like, you'll live with that, and you'll live with Amir Coffey, one for four, BJ Boston, one for three from three, Daniel Tice hitting one. Like, that's fine. They only took 27 threes, and they they forced them off the line and did a good job of defending the paint as well. And it really is wild, just the change in the way that the Kings are defending. 
And I, I mean, I think the increased physicality that's being allowed in the NBA has definitely helped because Mike Brown always talking about being physical, but without fouling. And now it's a lot easier to do that without fouling. And the Kings are just, you know, they're a team that need to be physical. And like Fox is always a super physical defender because they don't have the longest or most athletic players. You know, we have our fair share, Keon really long, Keegan long, and have some athletic players, but then obviously like you have Sabonis at center who isn't getting the most, you know, verticality playing Barnes out there, Lyles, Vizenkov, Davion, obviously. And just the way this team is playing physical defense is fun to watch. Looking at the standings, you had the Warriors beating the Mavs tonight, which was huge. Man, if we could have just gotten one of those games against the Mavs, that second game, it was there. If Malik Monk just doesn't go down in that game, like if he goes down against the Jazz, we might be in a better spot. Like we just needed 48 more minutes out of Monk. But still, we're within one. And I believe, so the head, the tiebreaker, it's head-to-head, which is tied with the Mavs right now. The Pelicans were also one game behind. Definitely don't have the tiebreaker with them. And we're tied with the Suns, where the last game of the season between the two teams will decide that tiebreaker. So against the Mavs, because they're not in the same division, I think it's conference record that it goes to. I believe I could be wrong. But right now, the Kings have one less loss and the same amount of wins in the conference. So I believe they hold the tiebreaker right now, but obviously it's very close. But the Kings play the Pelicans one more time, and you know one game back of the fifth seed. So this was a, a massive win. I mean, if the Clippers start going downhill, we're three games back of the Clippers. Who knows? And we have the better divisional record, so we would have the tiebreaker at least for now there. On the other side of things, if things start going poorly, we could slide to nine. We're three games up on the Warriors. That's probably not happening. Uh, but So we're probably not going to slide to ten. But we're, it's possible we slide to nine, only one and a half games up. But the Kings very much in the thick of things. Lyles and Vizenkov, especially Lyles being back, is huge for this team. And maybe there's even a little bit of pressure off now. When you lose a couple guys to injury, maybe... You got a little bit of an excuse. And it allows the guys to play a little freer now. Maybe, maybe not, though. Obviously, talking about the possibility of going even up to the fifth seed. But then you look at our schedule, and you're like, ooh, that's tough. Four-game road trip, New York, Boston, Brooklyn, OKC. So, three really good teams in Brooklyn. Trying to get our revenge against the Knicks here. It is a back-to-back uh, New York and then Boston. We also have a tough back-to-back when we come back home, Pelicans and Suns. So that's tough because especially those, those are very important games seeding-wise. But I think as we've seen all season long, it doesn't really matter what team's in front of us. Always got a chance to win. Also always have a chance to lose, but we always got a chance to win. So even if the schedule looks tough, I I got faith in this team to give ourselves a shot I'll say and if we don't worst case scenario I mean worst case scenario we're in that 9-10 playing game and we got to win two games in a row and that is what it is just you got to perform down the stretch in the important games and I'm very excited to see that and so I will be back on Thursday to recap that game against the New York Knicks peace